Hello, this is going to be replacing um, our in-class lecture on tissues. So what I'm going to want you to do is watch this, uh, listen to the lecture, and then answer some of the questions that I'm going to be asking uh, throughout this video. So we're talking about tissues, and uh, tissues are going to be between cells and organs as far as the level of organization goes. So organs are going to be composed of multiple tissue types that play a role in the function of the organ. For instance, a blood vessel is composed of three different tissues, an inner layer of a tile-like endothelial cells that secrete anti-clotting agents, a middle layer of smooth muscle, and an elastic <clears throat> connective tissue and an outer layer of fibroblasts and the collagen protein that <clears throat> that they secrete. So synthetic blood vessels have been built by humans in the lab by letting the cells grow, rolling them together, and allowing them to interact to form the desired outcome. In this case, create a uh, blood vessel that's wor a workable blood vessel. And so in medicine, this could be used for vascular grafts when vessel damage builds up in the legs, which is pretty common with age, or creating like new coronary arteries. So there's a lot of technology on how to create these organs based on their tissues. So in 3.1 and 3.2 objectives, we have four here. By the end of this section, you should be able to list the four major tissue types and provide examples of each uh, where they occur in the body. Describe the general characteristics and functions of epithelial tissues. Name the types of epithelium and identify an organ in which they are found. And explain how glands are classified. So an introduction here, tissues are groups of cells that have specialized structural and functional, functional roles. There are four major types. You have epithelial, connective, muscle, and nerve. So although the cells of different tissues vary in size, shape, arrangement, and function, those within a specific type of tissue tend to be uh, very similar or share characteristics. So let's start with epithelial tissues. Epithelial tissues covers organs, forms the inner lining of body cavities, and lines hollow organs, so is always exposed to the outside or to an open surface. It's going to be anchored to the connective tissue by a thin non-living layer called the basement membrane, and we can see that right over here. The basement membrane is going to be this purple layer, and on top of it we have these epithelium cells. Uh, they lack blood vessels, <clears throat> so the, the basement layer may have some blood vessels, uh, providing the nutrients, but it doesn't go all the way up. Those blood vessels don't go all the way up to the epithelium uh, layer. The nutrients are going to diffuse through the underlying tissues. If we take a look down here, we have our blood vessel providing nutrients from the blood cells and from the plasma that's going to diffuse up to feed and provide nutrients to the layers above. Epithelial tissues are going to be readily divided um, and they heal very quickly. So this is uh, your skin cells, these uh, open to the outside environment. And so they're more prone to damage. Since they're more prone to damage, we would like them to heal frequently and quickly and they're probably going to be the fastest tissues to heal. They're tightly packed to form a protective barriers like our skin and the lining of our mouths. And so it protects from the outside, but it also protects from losing like moisture from the layers below. These are going to be classified, the epithelial cells are going to be classified by cell shape and how many layers it has. They're tightly packed, so there's very little space in between them. 
and epithelial cells will divide readily and plentifully, ranging from 40 to 60 cycles of mitosis per cell, which is important because these cells are constantly getting damaged and replaced. So they also aid in secretion, absorption, excretion, and sensory reception. So our first type that we're going to look at are simple squamous epithelium. These consist of a single layer of thin, flattened cells packed tightly together in thin and broad. Uh, they have thin and broad nuclei. Substances pass easily through them, and therefore they're a common site of diffusion and filtration, which means we're going to find them in places like the air sacs of the lungs, <clears throat> Walls of the capillaries, these places where we want that diffusion of gases, diffusion of waste and nutrients. It's going to line the insides of the blood uh, and lymph vessels and covers membranes that line body cavities. Now, simple means that it's, it's one layer. So whenever you see the word simple, it means one layer. Squamous means it's thin, flat cell. So due to it being so thin, it's easily damaged. Um, this is important because when you like in your, this is why bad air or those, you know, those days in Arizona where it says carpool because of the quality of the air. It's important because that stuff can damage your, uh, your lungs because of how sensitive this layer of cells, this layer of tissues is, and we don't want that to be happening. Simple cuboidal epithelium. So again, simple means of one layer. Cuboidal means that it's a cube-shaped cell, and we can see that over here on the bottom right. <laughs> Uh, it consists of a single layer of cube-shaped cells, typically contain centrally located spherical nuclei. So we see those in the center of these cells. Covers the ovaries and lines most of the kidney tubules and the ducts of certain glands, <clears throat> like the salivary and thyroid glands, and the liver and the pancreas. In the kidneys, it functions in secretion and absorption, and in other glands, it secretes glandular products. Uh, what that means is... It's going to be producing hormones depending on which gland it's coming from. So testosterone from the testes or cortisol and aldosterone from the adrenal glands. It's going to be secreting uh, these substances. So simple columnar uh, epithelium. Simple again, meaning it's one layer. These cells are going to be elongated. So the, they're going to create these columns where the nuclei is usually located near the basement membrane, which means it's going to be found lower down here. So we've got our surface of the cell uh, exposed to the outside or internal environment. And then we have the basement layer on the other side. We have the nuclei closer to that basement layer. They line the uterus and most organs in the digestive tract, including the stomach, small and large intestines. And due to their elongation, they are thick, which enable them to protect the underlying tissues. They also secrete digested fluids and absorb nutrients from digested food. And typically, they're going to contain microvilli um, on its surface to increase its surface area to aid in absorption. So it's going to help those places in the digestive tract take in what you're consuming, those nutrients, macromolecules, vitamins, minerals, whatever it may be. Those microvilli are going to help absorb that due to the greater surface area that it has to interact with the outside or internal environment. Some specialized cells are glandular cells that you're going to see, um, known as goblet cells which are gonna secrete a protective mucus. The mucus is gonna help protect the organs and reduce friction at that layer. Now, pseudostratified columnar epithelium, it's gonna appear stratified or layered because the nuclei are at different levels here, um, but they're not layered. It's still one, one layer of cells. So the nuclei are going to look like they're at two or more levels in a row of aligned cells, um, but pseudo-stratified, pseudo means fake, basically. 
stratified means multiple layers. So fake layers of columnar epithelium. Commonly contain cilia, which moves the mucus secreted by the goblet cells. So we're going to find goblet cells at this layer too. And they line the passages of the respiratory system, which uses mucus to trap dust and microorganisms. And the cilia moves it up and out of the airway. So the role of the cilia in these cells is to move that mucus that is there for catching the dust, microorganisms, debris, um, and move it upward and out of the lungs because we don't want it to just sit there indefinitely. Stratified squamous epithelium means that there's going to be many layers of cells here which are flattened out as they get pushed outward. So we get them produced here at this bottom layer near the basement membrane and they just start pushing their way up towards the surface. So our skin is going to be a good example of this where the top layer is mainly dead skin. And we'll talk about uh, what happens and why it's important that we actually have that layer of dead skin. But as they get pushed up this way, they get flattened out. You can see these ones starting to get flattened out and they continue to get more and more flattened out. And so again, it's gonna form the outer layer of the skin or the epidermis. And as skin cells age, they accumulate keratin and then harden and die. So the keratinization uh, produces a dry, tough protective covering that prevents water loss. So that's why the top layer of dead skin is actually important because it's keratinized um, and it's going to provide that sort of armor to our skin, both from protecting it, like keratin makes it so it doesn't tear as easily, not as easily damaged, but it also creates this barrier so that we don't lose water unintentionally to the outside environment. It creates a, a form of insulation. So keratinized stratified squamous is always going to be exposed to the outside. If uh, we're talking about an inside or internal environment like the mouth, throat, vagina, or anal canal, it's not going to be keratinized. Those cells at the surface are going to be alive. So stratified cuboidal epithelium, cuboidal means that it's going to be uh, these cube shapes, and stratified means that it's going to be multiple layers, so it consists of two or three layers of the cube-shaped cells that form a lining of the lumen. This lumen is this opening uh, right in the middle of this. It lines the larger ducts of the mammary glands sweat glands, salivary glands, and pancreas, anywhere that we're going to have some sort of secretion happening. It also forms the lining of the ovarian follicles and the seminiferous tubules. I believe that's all I got for the stratifying cuboidal epithelium. When identifying these, it's important to, or when you're studying these types of epithelial cells, understand what the words mean, stratified, simple, cuboidal, columnar, all of those different things. It's going to help you identify it when we start looking at these under a microscope. Stratified columnar epithelium consists of several layers of cells and they're going to be that column shape. The superficial layers are elongated. The basal layers consist of cube shaped cells. So we're gonna have differences in their shape here. You can see in um, this image, that top layer, they're longer, more column-like. This bottom layer, these are gonna be more cube-shaped cells. Sometimes it's difficult to determine, uh, this is where the idea of that pseudo-stratified comes in, because this looks awfully similar to the pseudo-stratified. So you really gotta look in close and see, okay, is this two cells or is this one cell that looks like it's in two columns. So in this case, it is, in fact, uh, two different layers, one with the longer uh, columnar cells, one with the cuboidal cells. Located in the male urethra and vas deferens and parts of the pharynx. Now, transitional epithelium is going to be specialized to change in response to increased tension. 
These cells are special in order for uh, waste products to not be diffused back into the body. So it forms the inner lining of the urinary bladder and lines the ureters and part of the urethra where we don't want that, uh, that waste buildup to enter the body again. We don't want that diffusing through those layers of cells. So when the walls of these are distended or stretched out, the tissue at that top layer is going to stretch and expand. It forms a barrier that helps prevent the contents of the urinary tract from diffusing back into the internal environment. Glandular epithelium composed of cells that are specialized to produce and secrete substances into ducts or into body fluids. So one or more of these cells constitute a gland. Glands that secrete their products into ducts that open onto some internal or external surface are called exocrine glands. These are going to be the goblet cells that secrete uh, fluids or oils onto your skin. They're exiting some sort of, they're not going into the bloodstream, right? They're going out into the outer world, the external environment or the external internal environment. So your different uh, tracts in your digestive system. Glands that secrete the products into tissue fluid or blood, those are endocrine glands. Those are the ones that are going to be uh, sending those hormones through because you're not necessarily sending hormones out of the body. You want those going into the bloodstream and getting to where they need to be in order to interact with the cells and produce some sort of um, action. So types of glandular secretions, they're classified according to the ways that these glands secrete their products. So merocrine and eccrine glands release watery, protein-rich fluids by exocytosis. Most secretory cells, which can be uh, subdivided into two groups. So these are the two most common types of glandular cells. We have serous cells, which secrete uh, the secretions is typically watery and consists of enzymes and called serous fluid. And then we have mucus cells that secrete a mucus rich in glycoprotein, mucin, and typically secreted in the digestive and respiratory systems. Apocrine glands are glands that lose small portions of the glandular cell bodies during secretion, and the holocrine glands are those that uh, lose the entire cell, the entire cell lysis during the secretion. And we can see this uh, going on over here. So most of our glands are going to be this first type, where they're just releasing some sort of substance without any damage happening to the cell themselves. Then the apocrine gland, you can see that some parts of the cell are leaving by exocytosis. So the pinching off, it's losing some of the, uh, the, the plasma membrane or cell membrane due to these vesicles being sent off. <laughs> and then holocrine glands, the whole cell just comes off and secretes its contents um, through this lysis or dissolving of the, of the cell membrane. Um, going back really quick, in the holocrine, holocrine glands are also known as sebaceous glands, meaning they secrete sebum or oil and are found associated with your hair follicles. Um, just to give you an idea of where some of these are found, apocrine glands are most commonly found in the axillary, which is the armpit, and the pubic regions, and are not active until after uh, puberty. So here we have a diagram that kind of just shows you where you're going to find some of these different types of cells, those epithelial cells. And it's, it's a good list of uh, the key points for each type of cell. I recommend having some sort of drawing for each of these. It can be as simple as you need it to be, as long as it's readable to you. Um, but have these drawings in so that you can learn 
how the terms apply to what they look like. So before we go to 3.3 objectives, what I'd like you to do is go back and answer 3.1 and 3.2 questions on the attached uh, sheet that I've provided with this video. So again, those are right here. List the four major tissue types and provide example of where each occurs in the body. Describe the general characteristics and functions of epithelial tissues. Name the types of epithelium and identify an organ in which each is found and explain how glands are classified. So fast forward as fast as we can. Okay, 3.3. List the types of connective tissues within the body Describe the general cellular components, structures, fibers, and matrix of each type of connective tissue, and describe the major functions of each type of connective tissue. Now we're on to connective tissue and the important roles that the different types of connective tissues play. So connective tissues bind structures, provide support and protection, serve as a framework fills space, stores fat, produces blood cells, protects against infections, and helps repair damaged cells. It does a lot. It plays a very important role um, in a lot of different places. So farther uh, apart, you're going to find these connective tissues farther apart from each other than epithelial tissues. Epithelial tissues are always tightly packed. Uh, they're like right bumped up next to each other. Uh, here, there's some space. And that space is going to vary, but there's going to be more space typically in connective tissues between the cells themselves. And that space is called the matrix. It's an abundance of intercellular material. So the matrix is composed of fibers and a ground substance whose consistency varies. Some of this will be more solid material. Some of it will be more of a liquid material as we look at the different types of uh, connective tissue. So, the major cell types. Fixed cells, uh, fibroblasts, fibroblasts over here, are going to be fixed. Um, this means that they are present in stable numbers, they don't really move around at all. While wandering cells appear temporarily in tissues and or sometimes just a response to an injury or infection. So they come in, they do what they need to do, and then they get out of there. Um, so fibroblasts is one of those that is the most common fixed cell. It's found in stable numbers, large, star-shaped, and produce fibers by secreting proteins into the matrix. So these cells are just gonna be sending out proteins into that matrix or that space in between the, the cells themselves. The micro, macrophages uh, originate as white blood cells specialized to carry out uh, phagocytosis, acts as a scavenger, and defends cells from foreign particles. So this is going to be one of those that is a wandering cell because they come in, they do what they need to do, and then they get out of there. And then mast cells are large and widely distributed. These are fixed cells typically found near blood vessels, releases heparin, which is, uh, pre it prevents clotting from happening. And then histamine, which produces, uh, is a product during times of inflammation and allergies. So connective tissue fibers, the fibroblasts produce three types of fibers. The first one is collagenous fibers. These are thick threads of protein called collagen. Uh, they're grouped in long parallel bundles. They're flexible, important components of ligaments. Ligaments are going to attach bones to other bones. And then they're an important com uh, part of tendons that connect muscles to bones. A tissue contains abundant uh, a tissue containing abundant collagen appears white and is known as dense connective tissue and is referred to as 
white fibers. Then we have elastic fibers. This is another type of fibroblast uh, fibro product. It's composed of the protein elastin, thin fibers that branch forming networks weaker than collagen, uh, and they're easily stretched, and they're referred to as yellow fibers. And then we have reticular fibers. They're the least abundant of these three types. They're very thin, collagenous fibers, highly branched, and they form networks. So these fibers will be important in helping determine what type of connective tissue you are viewing. So if it appears white, then it's probably collagenous fibers. If it appears yellow, then you're probably looking at elastic fibers. The collagenous fibers and the elastic fibers are the most abundant uh, when skin. An interesting thing with the connective tissue, and this is out there, I see this all the time, people are trying to sell this product of uh, like collagen that you apply as a cream, and it's supposed to like get rid of wrinkles and make you look young again, like a fountain of youth. Well, unfortunately, that doesn't really work. So skin, when it's exposed to prolonged or intense sunlight, <laughs> the connective tissue fibers lose their elasticity. This is underneath the, the, the very layered epithelial cells that make up the skin. So it's very deep inside. Um, but those lose their elasticity, which is going to cause the skin to initially stiffen and then become the leathery. And over time, it's going to become saggy, and you're going to have a lot of wrinkles. If you see someone who spends every single day out in the sun, not wearing sunscreen, not doing these different things, it's not a good look. Uh, you just Your skin, when it's exposed to that much UV radiation, is just going to lose that elasticity, and it's going to appear saggy, and you're going to have lots of wrinkles. Now, collagen injections are going to be the... They're going to temporarily smooth out your wrinkles, but it's not a cure for the loss of elasticity. But collagen that is applied as a cream just doesn't do anything. It can't combat wrinkles uh, because the collagen molecules are too far. Uh, it, it, the, the collagen molecules in the cream are too large to penetrate the skin. The skin is a good barrier. So they're too large. They're not going to get through. They're not going to do what uh, these people advertise as, you know, this cream that's going to get rid of all your wrinkles and make you look young again. That's a bit of a sidetrack, but that's all right. So loose connective tissues, <clears throat> loose connective or areolar tissues forms delicate thin membranes throughout the body. They're mainly composed of fibroblasts, which are separated by a gel-like matrix that contains collagen and elastin fibers that the fibroblasts are secreting. Uh, it's going to, this loose connective tissue is going to bind skin to the underlying organs and it fills spaces between muscles. So the loose connective tissue is more prone to damage then your tendons and ligaments that play a very important role and need to be able to resist a lot of tension and a lot of forces. Loose connective tissue can't do that as well. <clears throat> it's still going to resist some tension, but it's more easily damaged than your, uh, than your other fibers, your collagenous fibers that make up your ligaments and your tendons. Let's see. So adipose tissues, this is your, your fat cells. Uh, it's a specialized connective tissue that develops when cells store fat in droplets within their cytoplasm and they enlarge. So these cells are gonna change size depending on how many, uh, how full they are becoming with this fat. Um, so it's a storage for fat, which can be used as energy. And you can see some of these are really large. Some of them are a little bit smaller. So when one loses weight, what's happening is these cells aren't going away. They're just shrinking. 
the cells themselves aren't going away. And it's thought that through adolescence up until adulthood, you're, you're gaining the number of fat cells. You're getting to the, your total number of fat cells. And then after that, once you hit a young adult, the number of fat cells you have stays the same. And it's also thought there's a lower limit as far as how much fat these cells need to store. So let's say if it can get down to 15% uh, full. Once it hits 15% full, it might send a message uh, through hormones, through you know uh, different ways to get you to eat more. It's going to increase your appetite because your body is saying, hey, we're running low on this storage of energy. We need to replenish. So these cells, when they get down to 15% or something, and again, it, it may be a different percentage than that, it may send a message saying, hey, we need to eat more because we need to get our fat stores up to like 30%, 50%, or whatever it may be. So when these cells are abundant, they crowd over cells and form adipose tissues. They're found everywhere. They're very important. Uh, they lie beneath the skin. They're in spaces between the muscles, they're in the joints, they're surrounding the kidneys, your vital organs, they're behind the eyes, uh, they're around the surface of the heart, they're in abdominal membranes, and they play the important role of providing a cushion to your joints and to your organs. So you're, they're not so easily damaged. It creates this nice cushion. Imagine wearing a big puffy suit where, I don't know if you've seen this, where <clears throat> you're in this big suit and you're rolling around, it's filled with air, and you're able to like roll down a hill, but you look like the Michelin Man. That's kind of the same role that the adipose tissue is playing. So it stores energy in fat molecules. The dense connective tissue, hold on one moment. Okay, the dense connective tissue is mainly uh, closely packed, thick collagenous fibers, and they have fine networks for elastic fibers. <clears throat> Relatively few cells are going to be present in the dense connective tissue, but they're very strong. They don't have a very good blood, uh, blood supply. And they're located in the white fibers of the, the eye and deep layers of the skin. So that's pretty much all you need to know for the dense connective tissue. The, the, the bad thing, whenever you see that it has poor blood supply. If this gets damaged, it's not going to heal very quickly. Um, and there's very few cells, very few fibroblast cells, and those aren't going to divide very much because they don't have the nutrient supply needed in order to fuel mitosis. Cartilage is going to be a rigid connective tissue. Provide support, framework, attachments, protection, and form structural models for developing bones. It's abundant and mostly composed of collagen and a gel-like substance. Uh, chondrocytes are cartilage cells, which do not divide very frequently and occupy small chambers called lacunae. You can see them over here. We have the cartilage cells that is occupying that space that space is the leukemia. The perichondrium is a uh, cartilaginous structure enclosed in a covering of connective tissue. So the perichondrium contains blood vessels that provide cartilage with indirect nutrients. So this indirect nutrients is going to pass through from the perichondrium uh, to the cartilage via diffusion so again, because of the lack of the direct blood supply, cartilage is not going to heal very quickly. It heals very slowly, and the chondrocytes themselves, the cartilage cells, are not going to divide 
very frequently. Three types of cartilage we're going to talk about. Hyaline uh, is the most common type. Fine collagenous fibers in its matrix looks like white glass. Found on the ends of bones, the nose, and supporting rings in the respiratory system. The elastic cartilage, a dense network of elastic fibers, more flexible than hyaline. Framework for external ear and your larynx. And then fibrocartilage. A very tough tissue, contains lots of collagen, it's shock absorbent of pressure. So we're gonna find this in between your vertebral discs. So cushion between those discs and it cushions bones in the knees and the pelvis. So when you have an older patient who has knee replacements, a lot of the time, the reason for that is because this uh, collagen, these fibrocartilage areas that are providing that shock absorbent um, uh, quality and that cushioning, they're, they're going away. They're degrading. And again, that doesn't replace itself very well. So we end up replacing the entire knee or the hip or whatever it may be. Now we're on the bone or osteocytes. They're the most rigid connective tissue due to mineral, salts, calcium phosphate, and calcium carbonate between the cells. It has these mineral deposits that make it very strong. The matrix contains a large amount of collagen, uh, supports internal structures, and provides attachment for muscles. All your muscles are going to be attached to the bone. That's the only way that, or, well, sort of, they're going to have at least one attachment to bone. All of your muscles are going to have at least one attachment to bone. Sometimes it's attached to connective tissue, like your your face muscles um, may be attached to connective tissue that are attached to the skin, providing you the ability to make facial features and smile, frown, do all those things. Your bone is going to contain red marrow that are going to produce red blood cells. Your bone matrix is deposited in thin layers called lamellae, which forms concentric patterns around tiny longitudinal tubes called osteonic canals. So let's take a look over here. We have our osteonic canal. We have these lamellae, thin layers that are going around, going around this circle. Those are all your lamellae. And because bone, so bone actually has good uh, blood supply. Um, your blood supply to your bones makes it so that they heal relatively fast compared to other uh, types of connective tissue, much faster than cartilage. So when you break a bone, it's going to be sometimes better than when you roll your ankle really bad and you damage the connective tissue there because bone is going to heal much quicker. Um, the osteocytes are the bone cells themselves, and layers of intercellular material are concentrically clustered around an osteonic canal and form a unit called an osteon. Many osteons cemented together are going to provide that substance of bone. Each osteonic canal each of these osteonic canals is going to contain a blood vessel so that every bone cell is fairly close to a, a, a nutrient source. So then we have blood. Blood is going to be classified as a connective tissue because it transports nutrients. It gets things around the body. It connects different parts, different organs. Uh, it supplies the materials between cells. Blood is going to help maintain homeostasis. It's composed of formed elements suspended in a matrix called blood plasma. So we have red blood cells. We can see these on the right. We have blood or white blood cells. And we have platelets. Most of the blood is going to be formed in the red marrow within hollow bones. 
Um, and that's all you really need to know for blood at this time. So again, we're about to get into 3.4. What I'd like you to do, go back. to our objectives for 3.3, and I'd like you to list the types of connective tissues that we have within the body. Describe the general cellular components, structures, fibers, and matrix of each type of connective tissue. Describe the major functions of each type of connective tissue. Okay, 3.4, there's only one objective, and that's to distinguish among the three types of muscle tissues. We have three different types of muscle tissue. Muscle tissue is only contractile. It's going to have an elongated uh, cell or muscle fibers that can shorten. That's, that's what it does. That's all it can really do is contract, but it provides a lot of very important things. So skeletal muscle is the, the type of muscle that you have voluntary control over. You can think about it, you can move your hand, you can walk, you can do these things, you can move your face, you can make uh, everything that you do as far as movement goes, that's skeletal muscle. Smooth muscle is involuntary. And we'll get into where smooth muscle is found in a bit. And then cardiac is, I mean, cardiac means heart, so there's a specific muscle type for just your heart. Your heart is a big muscle, and it's composed of all cardiac tissue. So skeletal muscle, again, is going to be found in muscles that attach to bones and that have a conscious that you have a conscious control over. It provides voluntary muscle uh, movement, long thread-like cells with alternating light and dark markings called striations. So if we look across here, these dark bands and these light bands, so there's so many of them. This is that's what striations are. Striations is that striped look that these muscle cells have. There's going to be many nuclei located near its surface. It's going to have a lot of mitochondria for producing the energy needed to contract. Uh, when stimulated by nerve impulses, the fibers contract and then they relax. So skeletal muscle, the keys is that it's striated and it's under voluntary control. Smooth muscle tissue lacks striations. We don't have that nice striped look over here. They're all this, these long cells, but there's no stripes on any of these. They're shorter than skeletal tissues. They're spindle shaped with one centrally located nuclei. Compose uh, hollow internal organs like the stomach, intestines, bladder, uterus and blood vessels, and you don't need to think about them. They're involuntary control, unconscious. You don't have to think about digesting your food or moving it through the intestines, right? It just, or moving your blood through your blood vessels through voluntary contraction. You don't have to do those things, uh, which is good. That would be uh, very unfortunate if you had to think about all of that stuff all the time. So it's involuntary, not under your control. Then we have cardiac muscle. It's only found in the heart. It's striated. You can see we have these stripes going across these dark and light bands uh, going across the cells themselves. The cells are actually joined end to end. That is also um, important with cardiac muscle. They're the only ones that are going to have this end to end um, attachment between the cells. And you can see the plates that they're attached at right here, right here, right there. So each cell is going to contain just one single nucleus. At each connection is a specialized junction called an intercalated disc. And we can see that pointed out over here. We have an intercalated disc there, intercalated disc there. This is also involuntary. You don't have to think about your heart beating. It just does it for you. The striated and cardiac uh, muscles do not divide again. That's important to know. They don't divide again. So your skeletal muscles don't divide again. The cardiac muscle does not divide again. So damage to these is uh, like if you have a heart attack, 
and nutrients is not getting to certain cardiac tissue, that tissue is going to die and it's going to have connective tissue fill its spot through fibroblast activity. And you're going to have this permanent damage to your cardiac tissue. Now in your muscle cells, um, it's uncommon or it's not likely that your cells divide, your muscle cells divide. They just get larger. Um, and so if, you, unfortunately, you can't like double the number of skeletal muscles, uh, cells that you have. You have that set amount. All you can do is you can uh, make them larger through like hypertrophy training, stuff like that. So when they, when you do damage those cells, they just heal themselves, but they don't make another, they don't make another cell altogether. And then we know that the heart is responsible for pumping blood throughout the body. Go back and answer the 3.4 objective. I'd like you to distinguish between the three types of muscle tissues include, is it striated or not striated? Uh, what is it voluntary or involuntary? Does it have one nuclei or does it have many? And we are getting close to the end, very close. 3.5 objectives describe the general characteristics and functions of nervous tissues. Nervous tissues are found in the brain, the spinal cord, and peripheral nerves. They're composed of neurons, which are right over here. That's the central body of your nerve. And then it's going to have these extensions. The neurons are located in the spinal column in the brain. And these uh, long extensions extend throughout your body. So the spinal cord, we want that because then your spinal cord, your brain, uh, that's all protected by the skeletal system. We want those neurons to be protected because this is one of those cells that do not divide again. Just like muscle cells, uh, specifically the skeletal muscle and the cardiac muscle don't divide again. They divide. They're made one time and that's it. So neurons sense changes. They transmit nerve impulses to other nerves, muscles, and glands. The nervous tissues also include uh, neuroglial cells, which are out here, these little dots that are scattered about inside the matrix. These support and bind the components and help the neuron with its structure and help the, uh, the, the long extensions in supporting where those go. Uh, phagocytosis, these neuroglial cells are responsible for taking in nutrients around the cell. They're going to be phagocytes. Uh, they supply nutrients to the neurons by connecting to them, uh, by connecting them to blood vessels. So through the neuroglial cells, that's how the neuron is going to get its nutrients. And that is everything that I got for you. Um, from this chapter. So before you close this out, make sure you answer this question. Describe the general characteristics and functions of nervous cells. There's only one slide on it, so make sure you take a look at this slide to answer those questions. Once you finish answering all of those objectives, I would also like you to write down three questions that you have, three things that you have about this presentation. What are some questions that you have from the presentation that you'd like to talk about or go over in class? I'd like you to come up with three, okay? It can be anything um, as long as it's related to tissues in some way, all right? Well, thank you for watching. I know it's been about an hour, so hopefully it wasn't too bad. Oh, good. I thought it stopped recording.
it did not. That would have been really unfortunate because that was a lot of time. Okay, anyway, not important. Uh, have a great weekend, and I will see you guys on Wednesday. Goodbye.